Okay. So here are the rails. <laughs> and here is our show. Completely off. Completely gone today. What in the world? Derailed. <laughs> Yay, you're here. Welcome to the CK and GK podcast. Let's get going. It's Tuesday. Yay, we're so glad you're here. We've missed you last week while I was on vacation in fabulous New York City. And Caitlin was getting COVID. And I was getting COVID. (laughs) Horrible. Well, welcome to CK and GK. Um, With me today, always, is Caitlin. Um, She's the woman that because she has been singing happy birthday so many times this week while she washes her hands, her family thinks that all she's eating is cake. How sad. (laughs) It's the only COVID joke I can make in good fun and not have to worry about being off color. Yeah, there's no, there's no. I don't want to discount the people who are in the hospital sick, dead sick. Yeah, really, really bad. All right. Well, because I need a doctor, I've got Jenny. She loves Belle Biv DeVoe, bunnies, chocolate, orange soda, Pac-Man, ponies, red wine, and she eats ketchup on cereal while she's pregnant. She's a brilliant and annoying endocrinologist. It's Dr. Elliot Reed from Scrubs. What? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I really need a doctor. <laughs> That's where that came from. Um, and you can hear that there's a third laugh track on the podcast this week. Um, mm-hmm. And as you know, we are a how-to show. So I have invited my friend Jennifer because she puts the fun in funeral. And long-time listener, first-time caller. She's mm-hmm. going to talk to us all about her business. Um, but before we do that, we have some shout-outs this week. Yep, we do. Um, also, <laughs> how morbid. You're talking about me washing my hands and then covid and then i need a doctor and then we go straight to jennifer talking about funerals <laughs> like i mean we yeah. support people who have suffered with covid and people who have had covid destroy things in their lives we are sorry for all of that but that said we have to find laughter somewhere so here we go but before we do that um we got to do our shout outs so i'm going to start with two shows that i've found a great deal of support in the past couple of weeks one of them is the Tipsy Exchange podcast. This is um, their tagline is two tipsy ladies research and then exchange ideas on topics of interest like sci-fi, pop culture, unexplained phenomena, anything goes with them. The other one is which is talking tarot. Um, these ladies, <laughs> this is my favorite tagline ever. Um, which is talking tarot and other things, a podcast about tarot, the occult, cryptids, aliens, myths, and any other topic. They they talk about all kinds of things. It's a great show. And Maddie is about to be a mama. She's having a baby in two days. So congratulations to oh Maddie. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. So congratulations to Maddie. And um, give those ladies a follow. It's a female-run podcast, both of them, Tipsy Exchange and Witches Talking Tarot. And I'll link them in the show notes. Okay. So um, are either of these family-friendly Mm, I because Abigail say... loves um, podcasts about cults. <laughs> <laughs> I would say they need a disclaimer. Okay. okay. You may want to screen them first, Mom. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to yeah. know. Yeah. Dude. All right. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love your kids so much. <laughs> well, it's cool. been two weeks. Since we have sat down and talked, and so um, we definitely need to catch up, and um, we do that first by talking about what's new in the world of sports, Yep. and so uh, my sports news goes hand in hand with my gem this week, <laughs> um, because <Uh-oh. laughs> we, as I said, we went to New York City, and we had a fabulous time. Yes, we came back with an unwanted souvenir, but... Um, I didn't get COVID, just my husband did. (laughs) But it was, yeah, it was unfair. (laughs) We had a phenomenal trip. And as part of our week there, we went to a Mets game at City Field. 
Oh, cool. And City Field is across the street from this giant tennis complex. Mm -hmm. And we're out in Queens. And I said to John, what's this thing about? Like, is there there a big tennis tournament here or something? Or do people just love tennis? Oh, Lord. (laughs) He looks at me and said, Jen. It's the freaking U.S. Open. Yeah, that's where they play the U.S. Open. (laughs) So, like I've said before, let me cut out some embarrassment for you, listener, and I will tell you all about the U.S. Open that happens at Flushing Meadows, which happens to be a giant tennis complex in Queens. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. First off, they don't just really love tennis. Okay. No. This is the fourth and final tournament in the grand slam which is the four big tennis tournaments around the world and those ten, uh, those tournaments are the australian open the french open and wimbledon and which um, wimbledon is happening right now right yes the u.s open happens at the end of august and goes into labor day weekend so they kind of plan it so that will happen so this one actually starts on the 29th of august this year it is one of the oldest tennis tournaments in the world it started in 1881 i had no idea it was that old right so if you are interested in watching a grand slam tennis tournament it happens right here in our country (laughs) in new york city (laughs) in queens in a giant tennis facility that i had no idea what it was and looked like a complete idiot in front of my husband (laughs) Especially since we're on our way to a ballpark and I am talking sports like I know what I'm talking about. Right. Right. Yeah, like baseball that makes me is my hard. wheelhouse. Right? right. I know what I'm talking about. I can own the conversation there. And I just like, it was like, is there like some big tennis tournament here? <laughs> yeah, Jen. The U.S. Open. It's <laughs> happened here for the last 30 something years. That's amazing. <laughs> I actually really like tennis and I. I'm not the best at following it, but I enjoy it when it's on. So I was watching. Um, Did you know that the U.S. Open is in New York? Is in, is in New York, yeah, in, <laughs> in Flushing, Queens. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching um, Rafael Nadal's uh, match today, and he somehow managed to pull out a win over the American Taylor something, and I can't remember his name. But that's not my sports news, so I'm going to go on and talk about mine. You know what else started today? What's that? UEFA Euro Women's Championship Soccer, which I'm so excited about. Um, oh, I it's all because you sang about it and you rarely sing on this show. You know, and I, it's funny because I like to sing, but I, yeah, I'm very excited about this. So this is also known as the Women's Euro. And the Women's Euro is 16 of Europe's top teams. Um, oh, starts- I thought it was just a way to buy fancy handbags. No, (laughs) no. (laughs) Um, You start with 47. Um, Sometimes like Canada and the U.S. are are sometimes peppered in there, but it's it's a European championship. So it's hosted once every four years. Um, This year, it's England and Austria are the hosts. So that means that that's where the games will be being played. So. Yep, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Interestingly, played by a British woman, right? Oh, my God. Tie in. It's all coming together. Okay. So um, the tournament, the UEFA tournament um, consists of two stages. So there's a three-game round-robin group stage. So there's 16 teams. They're split into four groups. They're labeled with a letter, and I'll go into that in a second. But the top two teams from each, based on points during a win... Um, or d- based on points in the first set of matches, uh, will advance. So you get three points if you win your game. You get one point if you get a draw for your game, which is a tie. And then the two top two point leaders it will advance to the knockout stage. So in the second stage, the knockout stage, this is the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and a final that's set for July 31st. The last two teams will um, play at Wembley Stadium in London, which is huge. It will be a packed house. It'll be amazing. So this year, the four groups are group A, England, Norway, Austria, and Northern Ireland, because remember Northern Ireland is its own country. Yes. Yes. Right. 
England is a three-time Euro champ, and they're the heavy favorite. Obviously, their home team also, so they're going to have a lot of people pulling for them. Group B is Germany, Spain, Denmark, and Finland. Spain and Germany are the the top two in that group, um, but Germany is an eight-time Euro champion, so they're probably really heavy favorites. Group but a C- zero-time World War champion. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> i'm sorry oh my gosh i did not expect you to go there <laughs> group c is the netherlands sweden switzerland and portugal sweden is a heavy favorite but the netherlands are probably close on their heels and group d is france italy belgium and iceland in france is ranked number three in the world so they're obviously a really heavy favorite too if you're interested and you want to watch, you can watch on ESPN. But um, as you know, we have listeners in Canada and they won't be able to watch it because it's not being aired in Canada, which I don't I don't know why. But if wow. you're an American, you can watch it um, on ESPN. That and is crazy. OK, you know what I'm going to be looking up for next week is why is Canada not watching this? Maybe yeah. just because they're bitter because they're not in it. I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that. Oh, you would this think is Canada's drama that to I England? have to know about. I right. have to know why Canada can't watch it. Right. I, I would think with Canada's ties to England that they would be like, yes, we shall watch this. But I am wrong and I am speculating. Is it because it's not hockey? Maybe. <laughs> Speaking of hockey, congratulations to the Colorado Avalanche. Yay. They are not the Edmonton Oilers, which was the team I had picked to win at all. Sorry. But they did beat the Oilers. Go so I'm glad fast. to see them win because at least the Oilers got knocked out by the championship team. My mom was sending me videos of she works in downtown Denver and she's sending me videos of the parade. She was like, it's madness down here. <laughs> it's like, yes, mom. Every time the Habs win, it's madness in downtown Denver. Um but yeah, she she was, I can't tell if she was excited or not, but I was excited that the Abs won. So go Abs. Congratulations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we love Stanley Cup, or at least I love Stanley Cup. You hockey. love Stanley I Cup. I'm, I just pull for the Abs and don't really care about the rest of it. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer, who I have been friends with for, I don't even know, decade and a half, um, we actually met at a uh, mutual friend's wedding, even though yeah. Jennifer had been my college roommate's lab partner multiple times. Weird. Isn't that oh. weird? We went to a school with 40,000 people. We knew the same people, but we never saw each other. We never met. Similar organizations. Yeah. And we just right. Never- yeah. Just never met. So she is That's showing crazy. me a tennis magazine where she is the cover girl. <gasps> yep. I played with a lot of trophies. tennis growing up. This you did a- play a lot of tennis growing up? I did. That's awesome. Did anything. you know that the U.S. Open was in New York? <laughs> uh, I did not. I just oh, thank, you. thank you. This is what I need to hear. <laughs> That's the sound clip for next week. I just tag John in it. <laughs> I can just tell you the only thing I know about gen- tennis is there was a player named Jennifer Capriotti who was oh, very famous yeah. when I was playing tennis. So I'm pretty much the same, right? Exactly. Yes. yes. Mm. You are holding a trophy. I could not see the sweatband of, yeah. under the inch of bangs. That's amazing. Yeah, those are pretty great too. Yeah, those are good anyway, bangs. Those are good bangs. None of That's this is amazing. real, by the way. And I oh, like that not. you were able to put no. your hands on it. <laughs> I was thinking real. it was like no. I was thinking like, is the trophy yours? <laughs> no. Oh my gosh! I thought that the trophy was at least this yours, and then someone just like, before Photoshop. That's amazing. It's okay, a good I really looking thought, fake. Yeah, I really thought mm-hmm. that like somebody like staged a cover for you, but I thought the, the sweatband is real. real. She said the sweatband is real. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm not really sure how this came to be. To be honest with you, probably a kiosk really in the mall, sure. right? That seems like like my parents got me a book <laughs> that had my name in it, and it was oh, like yeah, happy birthday, birthday too, Jenny Fearcob. <laughs> She is turning nine. <laughs> I had one of those too. My mother has one about going to the circus. And of course, yeah, that's the one I, I mean, have. Oh, every yeah. time it's like, and whoever typed his name in, it's, you know, in uppercase letters every single time. Yep. So it really stands out. Hold on. Does his, is his the one that has like, 
like he goes to the circus, but also he participates in in the circus by like being a clown at the circus because that's the one that I have, which is horrifying Maybe. because I have legitimate nightmares about clowns regularly. Like I am not a clown person. I cannot stand them. And this book yeah. is of of Katie participating as a clown in the circus. It's horrible. <laughs> the beginning of your nightmare exactly i mean can exactly. we be real though if you're not actually a clown who is a clown people uh, john wayne does anyone be like oh i love clowns john wayne Gacy. <laughs> this is not a true crime podcast okay oh, i can't <laughs> think anyone was like oh i love a good clown like if it you're like not in the clown arts like i was I watching um the good place the other day Who's yes and her house is like full of clown art the clown art uh -huh. yes it's terrifying it's absolutely <laughs> terrifying but that's how you know she's in the bad place Did yeah. i just give it away spoiler I it. <laughs> how dare i sorry how do you know she's not like in season one i've mm. seen it already i was just starting it over. oh there all right hmm. now I you had come a, forward i, I, I would have lived in that place of oh well i've only seen three episodes Oh, I should have I should have drugged that out. Yeah. You would have made me feel guilty for a long time. Okay. A so long time. I'm Catholic. It's I'm time for us to move to Caitlin's <laughs> favorite segment. The Yay. gem of the week. Yeah, and because it. it um has been a while, it's gem of the weeks. Mm, so okay. I have uh carte blanche to tell two stories here. Okay. Um the first one is we are visiting my aunt in New York City who I have not had quality time with in a while. Okay. Um, and so it was super great to go spend a week with her and, um, hang out with her, go see all of New York together and just have a great time. She had asked me ahead of our trip, what kind of snacks do y'all want in the house? And I said, well, you know, Abigail loves chocolate. doesn't really matter what kind. Sure. So she bought a bag of peanut M&M's. And the first day we were there, she said, also, Abigail, I want to go to the M&M store. And all of my friends who are native New Yorkers will not go with me because they say it's only for tourists. But I want to go. So you are going with me to the M&M store. Nice. So we all go to the M&M store and we buy a bunch of M&Ms. And she's got this bag of peanut M&Ms. And she's, I love M&Ms. I love them. And Abby's like, oh, I love them too. And Carol says, you know, when I would have a bad day at work, I could eat a super jumbo bag in just two traffic lights. <laughs> and i have never measured anything and how fast i could eat it in two traffic lights but of course what did i start doing <laughs> i am thinking like what is my two traffic lights bad day at work food mm, probably a sleeve of like samoas what are they called now they don't always call them samoas the the, the coconut caramel whatever. delights caramel delights oh. there it is those or um i also really enjoy the the s'mores girl scout cookies i could probably kill a couple of sleeves of those or at least a sleeve in, in two traffic lights i think i could eat an entire bag of twizzlers really wow. oh man i love twizzlers you're not a red vines person oh red twizzler. vines i i will say twizzler or red vines same thing oh you think? either one either no i'm good for either one okay and I will, same. no, but I will bite the ends off of it and use it as a straw for wine. <laughs> you know that sprouts sell red vines that are like <gasps> organic or something? No. <laughs> the I healthy mean, red vines, the organic right. ones, right. made only with natural corn syrup. Yeah, it's like beets. Yeah. <laughs> beets, red I'll vines, I'm out. All right, Jennifer, what is your two traffic lights food? It could be a lot of things. <laughs> That's both amazing and scary. Right. It's definitely not soup. I mean, it might no. be easy to tell you what is not a two traffic light. Oh, I mean, the soup. Soup would be really hard to... Yeah, soup would be hard. You'd... Soup. Spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. You had a bad day at work, so you just pick up a bowl of spaghetti and eat it on the way home. I'm trying to think of the last time I ate in my car. Yeah, I'm not really a big car eater either. Oh, I can kill some Wendy's fries and a Frosty. Together? Together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can kill that in two traffic lights. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what's your other gem? Okay, so right. during Abby and my quarantine, mm -hmm. we watched a lot of chick flicks. Yes. I introduced her to Still Magnolias. 
Oh, you did? Um, oh, oh, we wore oh. out the Hallmark Channel. And we watched Now and Then. <laughs> oh, I love this movie so much. Okay. It is so good. It's so good. It's so good. But there's it's... one scene early on in the movie. Yeah. Where Rita Wilson, Mrs. Yeah. Tom Hanks, says, oh, well, we don't keep hard liquor in the house. <laughs> and my 10-year-old daughter, God, I love her so much. But I don't know how I'm raising her. <laughs> Well, if you don't keep it in the house, where do you keep it? <laughs> she is definitely y'all's kid for sure. It's like, oh, Abigail. <laughs> no, no, she means that they don't drink she it at all. She means that they don't drink it. Yeah. She oh. doesn't mean that they keep it in the garage. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's so funny. What a was sweet good. girl. I love her. For those of you who don't know my husband, my husband is a very uh, religious coffee drinker and he drinks his coffee black like I don't think he's ever put anything in it like black ever. as midnight on a moonlit night <laughs> sure <laughs> that's you from howling? Twin Peaks right <laughs> I don't know is it okay well he's talking about how some people's coffee looks like a lighter color and he knows that it's because you put cream or milk in it or whatever and he's like you know like what's that stuff called like cremate I that's not it. <laughs> I immediately like snort laughed. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, you know that stuff that's like flavored and you put it in your coffee and I was like, do you mean coffee, mate? And he's like, oh yeah, that's oh, what yeah. it's called. He's like, I don't know. I never drink it, which is like totally legit, right? That he wouldn't know what it's called. So then I tell my friend Joey and Joey, <laughs> Joey starts <laughs> immediately launching into this monologue and she goes are you wondering what to do with your loved ones after death <laughs> you don't have anywhere to spread their ashes and you don't want them on your mantle <laughs> and she goes cremate let their death be your pick me up and then she said a camera <laughs> she said a camera pans over to a woman looking at pictures of grandpa while enjoying a cup of coffee <laughs> I when I tell you I laughed for like oh, Caitlin, 30 minutes. Oh, Caitlin, yours could be Irish cream. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed for 30 minutes. I could not stop. And my poor husband is like, it wasn't that funny. And I'm like, I'm not laughing at you. Like, yes, what you said was funny, but I'm laughing. I'm dying over my friend Joey saying, cremate. <laughs> like <laughs> let their death be your pick me up it's like the worst i mean i am laughing over jennifer going and relabeling all the products and their break room yeah, together. I'm, thinking about it. I'm thinking about it <laughs> that's pretty great okay it was it was good it was really good okay so if you cannot tell from our spoiler intros yes um jennifer works in the funeral industry mm -hmm. um she is a what is the correct term funeral director mortuary scientist i mortician. prefer mortician personally Ooh. but there's i mean there's okay. a few people that might still call us undertakers undertaker see i would not no. have gone there no, no i wouldn't have gone there now either. most people would call it a funeral director but i am duly licensed as a funeral director and an embalmer and i feel mm -hmm. like mortician a little bit more encapsulates both of those realms. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. So tell us if you have any tell gems. Us. We want to hear. Oh boy. Spill the dirt. Ah. If you will. Um, the dirt. <laughs> Jesus. Spill the cremate. That, that that does remind me of, of a funny gem. This happened a long time ago. But I usually run to the store and buy the supplies for the office. Okay. And I guess we were, okay. maybe it was my day off or something, but we were out of paper towels. So one of the helpers ran to HB -E and grabbed some paper towels and they had cute little designs on them. They didn't buy just plain white paper towels. And that's what we stocked the bathrooms right. with for drying your hands. And it had flowers and things on it. And one of the little sayings on it was dig in the dirt. <laughs> and, oh no. <laughs> Because I'm the one that usually buys the supplies. My boss ripped off a piece of toilet paper, circled it, 
wrote my name with a question mark on it and put it on my desk. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, I didn't buy that. Oh, that wasn't me. Man. I like, felt like I was in trouble. Like when you no. would get a test back with red writing. Right, right, right. No, 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 I'm not in trouble. I didn't do this one. I know. It was pretty great. Okay, well, let me tell you about this time last week that I got locked in the hearse. Uh, yeah, I'm going to need some more information. <laughs> <laughs> so, apparently, there's side doors on the hearse. Like, you have your passenger and your driver door, and there's two side doors, and then you have the very back door. Well, the side doors in the hearse you had does not have handles on the inside. Because no one's normally like, getting out of exactly. the back. Oh, so, my God. Apparently, when they shut, you're stuck in there. And we had been at a, and this is a full military service. We had been at a Catholic church, so we had to take the flag off. We draped it with the pall, which is the white cloth that, um, when you think here, pall bearer, the pall is the uh, white cloth that's draped over the casket to represent baptism. Oh, I didn't know I that. I never was. learned this. Yes, that's yeah. where the pall bearer is from, because they were the ones, um, some churches still let them do it. Some don't just because it's easier, but they usually are the ones that put the cloth on and mm. walk the casket down the aisle. Wow. So that's where you get pall bearer from. But, uh. We were at a Catholic church, and it was just a little bit difficult, you know, taking a flag off, putting it on the pole. When we leave the church, take the pole off, put the flag back on. Right. Um, and you want it to look nice when you come out. Exactly. And we didn't want anything taking the chance of sliding off. That would just mm-hmm. be disastrous. So we're not going in procession to the cemetery. We're just going to meet there. So we decided we'll put the flag back on the casket when we get to the cemetery. So I'm with my boss. We were trying to get the hearse ready for when everybody shows up. Um, the military was going to be the active pallbearers at the cemetery, so we got to put the flag back on. My boss opens up the very back door. He's putting that side on. As you can imagine, you know, metal's pretty slick and the cloth is pretty slick. So I go in through the side door and I'm, you know, putting it on the other side. Right, right, right. Our, our car was parked a little bit at a tilt and the door shut behind me. Well, my boss shut the door. Yeah at the same time and walked away. Oh. <gasps> I'm sitting here <laughs> next to this casket and pe- people are starting to show up and I can't get out. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it's no. not like you can like pound on the window and oh, ask for no. attention. Well, nobody by me to even hear me if I did. <laughs> so oh, my finally gosh. my boss kind of realized that I was missing <laughs> and looked back at the <gasps> car and I'm like, hey. I'm sorry. Whoa! That's like nightmare fuel for me. Like, no, 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 we're interrupting your regular podcast with an invitation. Yep. You're invited to join us at the Tipsy Exchange, where your hosts get tipsy and exchange ideas on a specific topic. Pop culture, true crime, unexplained phenomena. Nothing's off limits on the Tipsy Exchange. So grab a drink and visit the tipsyexchange.com to find the show on Apple, Spotify, or whatever is your favorite podcast app. I'm Burley. I'm LA. Now back to the show. Caitlin, what are you obsessed with? um, Just anything that makes me feel better. So like tea and um, sleeping. Sleeping makes me feel better. I've been doing a lot of that. Right? Well, I mean, you're working really hard to try and heal. Or are you hard to work? (laughs) No, my my body is barely working. (laughs) It's hardly working. (laughs) Thank you, Jennifer. (laughs) No. No, I get, I get breathless so easily, (laughs) like just talking for a prolonged amount of time. Like you're going to hear me like (gasps) sucking air during this. And if you have to cut it out, feel free to do so. Um, but yeah. And then, um, did you guys know that they make, um, it's like a bath bomb, but it's for your shower and it's like a little tablet and you put it in there and it. And it has eucalyptus and mint oils in it, so it helps me breathe when I'm in the shower, which is a game changer. Also, when my heart rate, like, my resting heart rate more than doubled the first day that I had COVID, 
<laughs> and or the first day I tested positive for COVID, it was pretty scary. Um, and I don't, I would highly recommend every family have one of those pulse, um, pulse Oximeter? monitors, oximeter thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes on your finger that they give you at the doctor's office and they put on your finger for a little while. Put one, get one of those in your house and just have it because it will make you so feel better. So we ordered one. Yeah. When you sent me that story and said yeah. your heart was racing, you couldn't control it, you couldn't slow it down for like an hour mm-hmm. or whatever. But mm-hmm. the thing that kept you like calm in your mind was the pulse oximeter. Mm-hmm. Um, I told John to order one, but mm-hmm. I don't know what a good number is. Um, what is it supposed to be? Zero, I think, is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> The mortician says, folks, anything above zero is probably a good thing. (laughs) Um, Well, my understanding is that if your oxygen level is above 95, that's a good thing. But if it drops below that number, then you should probably talk to a doctor. And if it gets below 90, you should probably go see a doctor. Okay. Um, And mine, mine like hovered around like the 94, 95, 96 area. Um, when I was, when I was having a really high heart rate, um, but it did, it did improve and uh, it's getting back up to 99 and 100, which is really good. Um, but that thing was the only thing that calmed me down when I was panicking. Like, yeah. uh, otherwise I probably would have lost my mind. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, I'm grateful for vaccines. I don't know about you guys, but the fact Absolutely. that my whole family is vaccinated, including myself. And again, I had a, like a scary day of COVID. I didn't have to go to the doctor or anything like that, but I did call a couple of times. Um, and I'm just grateful that cause my husband and son have not tested positive this entire time. So that's my, those are my obsessions right now. Just oh my gosh. John is wellness. on a cocktail of meds that when I went and picked it up, the pharmacist was like, Oh, does he have COVID? <laughs> <laughs> so obvious. Like, yeah, he Actually certainly does. does. He just has this fever. And I said, he doesn't have one. She goes, yeah, that's a thing. If you're vaccinated, you might not have a fever. Yeah, mine, my fever stayed really low. I, it was high for me. Like I usually am right around the like 97 degree mark. And so for me, when I crept up into 99, 100, I knew that something was wrong. So, but you know what it made me think of is temperature checks no longer work. Right. Right. Because if you're vaccinated and you can have COVID and not a fever, Mm-hmm. Checking people's temperature at the door isn't um, a good it way to find work. out who's out, uh, who's safe and who's not. Yeah. All right, Jennifer, what are you obsessed with right now? Um, I'm still obsessed with Wordle, Portal, and Octurtle. Okay, what? <laughs> this sounds like I'm sorry, characters what are from the, the Bible. Two? What are you right? talking about? It sounds like Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Like, what? So we've got Wordle, right? We're yeah. familiar with Wordle. We, we know Wordle. Yeah, okay. we're into it. But Cousin Octurtle? What is that? Okay, no. There's, there's Quirtle, which is four. You're simultaneously doing four, and there's Octurtle, which is you're simultaneously trying to guess eight words. <gasps> okay, did you know that there's another one also called there's Hurdle, which I'm sure you've heard because you listen to the show, so you know Hurdle. Oh, but there's another one. Now. Ah! Nah, ha, ha, ha. Um, there's another one called Worldle, like. It gives you a picture of a country, just a black country, and you have to figure it out. I'm pretty good at it because I used to be a geography teacher. Yeah, I'm just going to say, like, let me just be super basic right now and say, if it's not like America, I probably can't guess it by the shape. I wonder if they could do it. And that's only because I know the shape of Florida. (laughs) (laughs) Florida. I love it. Okay, so if it's a square, I know it's Colorado. Colorado's on a square. It's a close. It's pretty close. It's pretty it's close. Uh, it's the only state besides Texas that has chips in its shape. Because Cheez-Its. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so tell me about Octurtle. Yeah, what? Okay, so you're playing. You So you're doing four letters and, and an eight letter one? That's how it works? No, no. So it's, so they're all what, five letter words? Yeah. Okay, right. With Wordle? Yeah. But you're doing four different words with Portal. You're doing uh-huh. four different words, but every time you guess a word, those letters go into every single one. So you have <gasps> to like guess all of them and you oh, know. Whoa. Yeah. Same thing with Octurtle. It's your there's eight different words you have to guess, but every time you guess a word, it goes into each 
words no. guesses. So Ock turtle makes me feel like I need to take shots. Like I just don't think that I can. Like I'm not. I can't even graph. A, like a picture this in my mind, let alone try and make it happen in real life. I have such a limited attention span that I would like pay attention to like the first three and be super into it. And then I would screw it up on the And you'd be like, end. oh, like, wait, there's five more words right, and I have exactly. no letters in any of them. I will say, exactly. I think I've gotten pretty close, but then I have to scroll <laughs> like up and down because some of the words are hidden. And that mm. helps me out when I think I'm doing really well, but I'm really not. I- okay. Also, I'm thinking of a turtle with eight heads right now. Like, and I can't oh, get that. Oh image my god! Head. Kind of like Kerberos, like the dog with three heads. Yeah. <laughs> what is absurdle? I don't know. There's one called absurdle. I feel like this is a new Izzle, adding Ertle. Right. Everything. Right. Uh, Next thing we know, Snoop's gonna have a story, and it's gonna be this big old rap that ends in Ertle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh wait, Dr. Seuss already did it. It was called Yurtle the Turtle. Oh, that's right. Yurtle the Turtle. <laughs> no. It was about oh. Hitler. Yeah, he yeah. was he was kind of rude. To <laughs> Ralph? Was that Hitler was kind of him? rude. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Who was at the bottom? Was that Randy or Ralph? The turtle at the bottom? I don't remember. I'm sorry, I but I remember. wouldn't believe either one. I feel like Ralph is more of a Susian word. Okay, so today we are here to learn all about um, Jennifer's experience being a mortician. And specifically, um, if you, listener, are in a place where you are either planning for yourself or for a loved one, what you can kind of expect um, from your, um, mortician as you are walking through that process. So the first question I have for you, Jennifer, is how did you choose this career? Um, started way, way back. My, actually my, I remember distinctly driving down the street with my dad. Um, I must've been around 10 maybe. Okay. And we were talking about what I might do when I grew up and, so I posed the same question to him. You know, when you were a little, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I think I gave the generic, you know, veterinarian. Ballerina. ballerina firefighter. Yeah. Like, marine biologist. Marine, marine biologist. Marine biologist. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. What are those? I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was 10 years old. Nice. Actually, what I always wanted to be was the person that makes soundtracks for movies, that picks the song. <gasps> Ooh, that's a that's cool like, job. I that. And I also wanted to be a jockey. <laughs> Wait, what kind of jockey? Like a, a disc, disc jockey? jockey or oh. a horse jockey? Both, I guess. <laughs> because I feel like disc jockey is like disc jockey for movies. It's like the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But I digress. Okay. We're so, driving anyhow. down the street. I pose this question to my dad and he tells me, well, when I was young and my father said, you know, what are you going to do with your life? I told him I wanted to be a mortician just to get his goat, just to freak him out a little bit. And my dad said that, and I was like, "Eh, why would that get somebody's goat? Like, I don't really understand why that would be a bad thing. It just didn't occur to me that it was kind of a, that death was so taboo, I guess. It just didn't occur to me. So many years later, I'm about to graduate college. Um, the firm I currently work for actually, uh, took care of both my grandparents. One had, my grandfather had passed, um, not too long within the year before I graduated college and I was an anthropology major. So was into skeletons and bones and cultures and all sorts of things and traditions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, um, was thinking about that. And I remember when my grandparents died, I just thought that that was just the coolest, most sacred duty you could have. Mm. I just was so impressed with this family and that you could take care of people like that. I mean, these people can truly not take care of themselves in any way, shape or form. Mm. And it just seemed like such a trusted, sacred thing. I and love that so about you. I, I, called the funeral home and said, you know, I'd really like to shadow you about to graduate from college. I have no idea what I want to do. Long story short, I shadowed and went back to mortuary school, 
I did my apprenticeship and the family hired me and I've been there for 16 years now. So, Oh my gosh. So talk to me about mortuary school. Like, um, do you have to have a college degree in order to apply or what does that look like? So you do not, um, if mortuary school now, uh, I actually had to go in person. I went to Houston to the Commonwealth Institute of Funeral Services and they have an excellent funeral museum. If you have nothing mm. better to do while you're in Houston. Mm. Um, <laughs> good, good to know, good to know. We'll if the mind. Astros aren't in town right. and the U.S. Open happens to be in Queens that year and you're not terribly you hungry can, and <laughs> head on over to the funeral museum right. it's pretty neat now you can do some of it online so okay. that's kind of neat but at the time you had to actually go to school so I say that at the time I get so old yeah because we're all old like we know things have changed hmm. I uh, didn't have to take the basics but because yeah. you were coming in with a college degree, you were right. exempted from that. I didn't okay. have to do that. Now, you can take two routes. If you want to just stop at being a funeral director, the schooling is not quite as long. It's a little less than a year. You have to do your apprenticeship um, with the funeral home, and then you take your boards, pass the law exam, and then you can get your license through the state of Texas. Okay. If you want to also be an embalmer, you have to be a funeral director as well. You cannot just be an embalmer. So you can be okay. a funeral director or funeral director and bomber. And um, you already told us that you have that dual certificate. Yes. Okay. And so if you get both. Because you're fancy. Them, because I'm fancy. And they won't do why. Is that start? Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's um, <laughs> <laughs> if you get both of your licenses, it's the equivalent of an associate of applied science. So, okay. Oh, interesting. Um, these okay. schools can technically be considered trade schools. Mm -hmm. um so which is fun because technically the funeral industry in texas is considered a trade and not a profession even though we are oh, that's interesting i culture. totally think it's profession if you're licensed right no it's a trade school degree and oh. so we're but we're held to professional standards which is just a very it's, it's like teaching. very interesting yeah area to be in yeah but, very gray mm -hmm. yeah it is very gray it is very gray so I did my apprenticeship. At the time, you could do it at uh, the same time as you were going to school. So Monday through Thursday, I went to school in Houston, got in my car Thursday night, drove back here to Austin, worked at my funeral home Friday, Saturday, Sunday, got in my car, went back to Houston. Jeez Louise. Oh my gosh. did that for about a year. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. Oh it was rough, gosh. but I got it all done in a year. And then yeah. you had to go to the hospital and get an IV. Yes. Like, I could not imagine <laughs> doing that. It was a long year, but I was very motivated. I right. was very, mo I mean, uh, it and was young and young that to be young too. To be and young. to drive back and forth from Houston. Like it's nothing. Right. Like, yeah, it's nothing I know. Good. I know. I made a it's lot of you know any uh, mixed CDs for myself. Nice. <laughs> See, this jockey. This jockey. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay. So pull back the curtain for us and walk us through both sides of the experience, right? If I'm a family in need of planning a service, what does my experience look like? And you as the mortician, what does your experience look like? Yeah, obviously very different. I've been right. on, on both sides of this with, you know, my own personal loss and with my job. I would say on the family side, you're completely scatterbrained. You have no idea what's going on. You're pretty much on autopilot and right. Survival mode. Comprehend about 30% of what the funeral director says. Okay. So you know, know that as a funeral director. Yeah. I just, to me, when I went through that and I was already working in the funeral home, I was, it really gave me a whole different perspective because I was just shocked that the world didn't stop. Mm. And that's, yeah. you know, I was like, my world just stopped. Why is nobody else, like, right. why people drive down the road with music on and their window down? Like, how can you remotely do that right now? Yeah. People come in and you have to purvey to them so quickly that you can be trusted. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. someone is trusting you with one of the most precious things in their lives. And they don't know you from Jack at the Bar to really connect with your families. And there's some that are skeptical. I mean, we're not portrayed very well in movies and there are bad apples as in any industry, but when it happens in this industry, it's 
it's just so shameful. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah, it's because, appalling. And The Undertaker didn't do much for you in WWF. No, my hair's never that greasy. <laughs> <laughs> that was not that was not the line I was expecting you to say, but that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so family comes in and it's your job right away to establish trust and a safe space. Absolutely. And I accredit my ability to do that to the firm that I work for. It's a family operated firm. Hmm. You know, we don't have to memorize a speech that we have to say to a family. Hmm. Um, so I can connect with him just as a human, supporting a human. Going so the relationship it. becomes exactly. organic rather than contrived. Exactly. I usually sit down and the first thing that I tell my family is I give them an overview of what I hope to accomplish in our meeting. Oh, um, perfect. Because I think that just gives families a little bit of an idea of like, okay, I can handle this. You know, this like, okay, that seems manageable. Yeah. And so the first thing we're going to start with is what questions do you have? Is there anything on the tip of your tongue? I mean, I always, families usually come in with some <laughs> good some questions, crazy questions, questions <laughs> all sorts yeah. of questions. They're not running on all cylinders. So I usually tell, you know, if something I say sparks a question, interrupt me, ask me, because I don't want you to have to hold on to that. Right. Uh, you're not gonna- and miss whatever the, the um, messages that you're trying to send right. because, because they're, they're working so hard to try and find the answer to their question. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I can keep us on track. So don't you worry about that. Like you, you can, you know, you can interrupt me as much as you want. Um, so usually I say that and usually when we get thing, those things kind of taken care of right off the bat and I can put their mind at ease a little bit, it usually they're just a little bit more comfortable. They usually ease up a little bit. I can see in their posture, they just kind of struck down a little bit. They're not so rigid. Mm. And just getting those things off, like out of their head, they want to talk about. Right. You know, once we kind of go through a few of those things, next thing I want to do is collect the information that I need um, to generate a death certificate. The funeral home is the one that collects all the information for the death certificate. Where was your loved one born? Um, mm. What's their birthday? What's their social? What's their parents' name? What's their mother's maiden name? Mm. Um, all that information, all that biographical vital statistic information we have to collect for the death certificate. Uh, luckily now everything's done electronically. It used to be, we'd have to type it out and run to doctor's offices and oh my beg, beg the receptionist to actually give it to the doctor. <laughs> and I remember being an apprentice and my boss at the time would say, don't come back until you have this certificate signed because gas is expensive. You know, you're running into Austin to these doctors and I'd sit there in my suit in doctor's offices. I was so caught up on celebrity gossip from the magazines. It was insane. (laughs) (laughs) And also it's uh, it's issues from six months ago. So you're caught up on what happened a while ago. This is true. And I also got some great recipes out of some of these good houses. And you know where Waldo is in every magazine of highlights. This is true. This is true. So luckily it's all electronic now. The next portion I like to discuss with my families is what do you want? You know, do you want cremation? Do you want burial? What are you envisioning? You know, what did the person ever talk to you about what they wanted? And then the last thing we would discuss would be pricing, going through our price list and saying, you know, here's the things you need based on what you told me. Here's the things that are optional. Do you want them? Do you not? And just to go through those items, choosing a casket, an urn, Um, You know, I need to figure out some specifics, like what cemetery they do they want? Do they have a plan for their urn to go somewhere? And then we briefly do touch on perhaps an order of service if they're having that. But that's more for the minister to decide or whoever they have officiating. It doesn't need to be a religious entity, but whoever they have officiating really is the one in charge of that. Come funeral day, you know, we're there to run sound. We're there to turn on music and whatnot, but the flow is really dictated by the missions. Okay. Depending on what they want to do, we'll get into more specifics like, do you want obituaries? Do you want flowers? What kind of clothes are you going to bring? What dates, what times are going to work? Are you going to a church? Are you having it here? I mean, there's so many moving parts to sort through so fast. What kind of things could I be thinking about before having to have a meeting with you? Well, I will say, I cannot tell you how many times people have come into the meeting and they say, I have no idea what they wanted. Right. They never wanted 
talk about it. Now, the living person that's in charge of making these arrangements now has no direction whatsoever. It doesn't have to be prepaid. Just telling somebody what you want, even if you haven't planned a thing, just telling somebody what you want. Now, obviously, the more... That is kind of a gift. You're right. Because now the person who is mourning you is not also trying to figure out what you would have wanted. Exactly. And then when that happens, that's when we run into issues of guilt. Mm. You know, if they can't afford what they think the person wanted or if they're not sure they're doing the right thing. And what if they find out later that they wanted to be buried and they did a cremation? I mean, I know we don't want to talk about it. Our society is terrible at talking about death. Sure. But it's guaranteed to happen. So it's kind of the one thing I feel like we should probably mention. And hospice is just so awesome at bringing that conversation up with families. I think hospice nurses are absolutely amazing. And I think they're kind of are at the forefront of bringing this conversation of death back to the family because death has gotten so institutionalized. We go to hospitals now. We go to nursing homes now. Whereas death was, it was more talked about. I know. I, I don't it, want to know. I don't want to face it? my own mortality. No, so I, mean, I understand. I, but you're I right. I, I had never that. thought of it as making it easier for the people I'm leaving behind. You can go to a funeral home, not pay a dime, and you can make arrangements with them. You can go there. You can go give them all your death certificate information. You can tell them what they want. Now, that doesn't prepay anything, but that the funeral home will keep that information on file for you. That's so incredible. You can at least do that. It costs nothing other than you have to talk about your own mortality. <laughs> but oh my gosh, that's what I'm doing for my 40th birthday. All right. I, <laughs> I can't wait. I'm going to wrap up our information sheet and I'm coming to you with that. a bottle of champagne and you and I are going to make arrangements. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm just thinking about like how much anxiety that I have about being a burden on someone else. And the last thing that I would want to do as my last act on this earth is continue to be a burden by not making these decisions ahead of time. Right. Right. By not communicating that to someone who cares about me. Like that's well, and there's some freedom in doing it now where I feel like, Oh, well, it's not going to happen for a while. I don't know. Right. I cannot decide what's going to happen tomorrow, but it's not as scary when I'm doing it for what I think is going to be 30 or 40 years from now. No, that's true. That's true. I have one of those books that's called like, I'm dead now. What? And you are supposed to like make all these plans. No, see, I have it right here. I bought it when I was going. It's literally called I'm dead now. What? That's that is actually the title. I actually bought this when COVID was rampant and we didn't have vaccines yet. And I was going back into the classroom and I didn't know what to expect. So I bought this book and I haven't completed it because it made me anxious, but of course, it's like where you put, like, these are my insurance policy numbers. This is my uh-huh. social security number. This is what I want to be done with my body. Like, it's okay. all those things. Please link that in the show notes. Oh, I'll find it. I think I just purchased this on, like, the big Jeff Bezos uh, Yeah, 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 thing. yeah, yeah. Many oh, years ago, you once said to me that you love being part of a family firm because you get to take a family all the way through the process, including even checking in on them six months later. Um, I have oh, to imagine that there's see. a lot of people in your trade slash profession that also have those feelings. Talk to me a little bit about what it would mean to carry a family all the way through. That is just such a sense of pride for me. I've never had a bad dream about work other than like maybe showing up late to a funeral or something. That's the thing. <laughs> but I sleep very well. To meet a family, perhaps at the hospital, at their home, at the darkest hour meet with them the next day to be able to do the embalming if that's what they choose do the dressing and makeup meet them again for the funeral take them to the cemetery i mean that's um it's just an awesome feeling they really i mean these families really connect with you Mm. the families have to open up their hearts pretty fast you You really care for the living so much more than those who have died You're caring for the living. Absolutely. It is. And I I mean, I definitely feel like I'm an advocate for my families. I mean, cue Lion King music here, but it feels so cool. That's the wrong word. Cool is not cool. But it's just to contribute to the circle of life. There are certain things in life. Do we have to have football players? No. 
do we have to have people that take care of the dead? Yes. And mm. to have a role like that is just, it's a very much as a sacred duty. When I first started at the firm I'm at, the owner said she always felt that it was a ministry. And mm. I very mm. much agree with that. I may not be, you know, reading biblical text to anybody on a regular basis or preaching a sermon, but what I get to do is just amazing to be brought into a family's world, to become part of a family in as little as, you know, four or five days. And, you know, it's not just one family that we're working with. We're working with multiple families at the same time, but you have right. to make every family feel like they're the only family that you're dealing with. Right. Because yeah. it, as you said earlier, their world stopped, their world stopped when this happened and you have to be the one who helps them get it going again. And that is truly, I, I mean, I don't necessarily subscribe to like, you know, biblical references too often, but I do feel like this seems to be a calling for people. Um, it's pretty clear that you have been called to do this. It, it matters that much to you. Um, and I mean, again, taking care of the living in their darkest hour just seems like what you're doing is absolutely a sacred duty. I would say most funeral directors probably feel that way. I know. We have to be stoic. We can't be the ones getting emotional with families. Um, that took me a very long time to learn. That's something that you cannot learn in school. It took me years to figure out how to be uh, compassionate with the family, but not break down with them. Kind of walk that fine line of still being a, a pillar for them so they know somebody's leading this operation. Right, right. Mm -hmm. My Absolutely. goodness. Wow. I am so impressed. So um, let's lighten things up. Tell me about the most interesting or creative services that you've been a part of. Oh, boy. I, the one I think about first is the person rode motorcycles. So we brought the entire motorcycle into the chapel. That was pretty cool. Wow. This Can you fit a Subaru in there? Oh, <laughs> um, no. <laughs> we can put, we've done so people like Corvette clubs and things like that uh we'll put it right in front of the front door okay oh, that's so kind of cool it's part of it we've had which is cool we've had someone that was um oh he was like a president of some local corvette club and so we had a bunch of corvettes and the procession was just so cool oh yeah uh, and loud, I've done I motorcycle funerals because as they're getting ready as we're getting ready to go to the cemetery they just sit in that parking lot and rev their ass. Oh, I bet. Oh, wow. So loud. And I just, it's the coolest ever. But I will have yeah. to say my favorite, and this is not necessarily creative, if you will, because it was part of their culture, but mm -hmm. this is my favorite family of all time. I took care of both the mother and the father within several years of each other, but um, they were from Nigeria, and the father had been... Um, I can't think of the official of some official sort of his of a tribe. Oh, okay, okay. A pretty big tribal leader. It was just so awesome. As the family was walking out of the chapel after the service, they did so with their traditional music, and they were dancing um, mm. the traditional dance. It was so cool. We got close to the cemetery at a church. They had a horse drawn carriage that they hired. Cool. Yes, yeah, wow. so we loaded the casket from the hearse to the carriage, and we walked down the street. And they were blaring the music and dancing behind the uh, horse-drawn carriage into the cemetery. And it was just, it was so awesome. Yeah, so here is what I'm hearing. Um, motorcycle, Corvette, Nigerian dancing, like all of these are about joy and celebration. They really are. And that's... Mm. Um, so <laughs> I'm telling you, I am planning my funeral over a bottle of bubbles. I like it. <laughs> And I will say there's been a major change, even from when I started to the way services are conducted now. Um, a lot of people are choosing not to call it a funeral. They're choosing to call it a celebration of life or a celebration mm -hmm. of life and faith. Mm -hmm. um, they're a lot less morose. Okay. You know, we're choosing to celebrate the person that lived versus just the event of them passing away. I mean, that is a single event but there's so much more to a person than just that they died how do you want to be remembered and so that's the question right yeah. is 
if there's some sort of send off that, that can be done that allows people to walk away with either refreshed memories or new stories that they didn't know or something like that. To me, that feels way more honoring. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And there have been so many times that a minister has just really done a great eulogy or someone has stood up and told a memory and I am just dying laughing because people just share the funniest stories. I mean, everyone's laughing. So it's not just me. No, that's right. good. Yeah, but no, I, just, that's... I don't know these people. And I just love that by the end of a funeral, I'm like, I wish I knew this person. You yeah. know, that to me is like a good funeral is when it's over. I'm like, I wish I knew this person. And that's how, that's what I want. I hope the funeral director goes, I wish I knew, wish this, I person. knew this person. <laughs> that's amazing. That's it. Okay. Well, um, we want to offer our listeners a chance to donate to a charity. So what organization would you like for us to promote on your behalf? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I would say Camp Agape. I was working with uh, Footprints as a local, it's a children's grief organization, and we have since kind of melded with Camp Agape. And... It's really to help children going through grief because children grieve so differently from adults. Mm. You can tell Mm. an adult that someone passed away and they'll break down in tears. You can tell a child the same thing that's eight years old and they'll go, okay, take a basketball, go inside and play. They're still hurting. They are just not expressing it the same way. And I think sometimes children get left out of the conversations of death. Mm. But how they experience death And any type of loss at a young age is how they're going to deal with it the rest of their lives. You know, any Mm. kind of loss, whether it's a romantic loss or, you know, a loved one that's passed a job loss, any kind of loss kind of follows the same steps of grief. So I think that children need to be brought into the conversation. And I think what Camp Agape does is amazing. And that is who I would love for you guys to mention. Absolutely. And Jenny and I will make a contribution um, in your name as well, too. And there's so many grief resources out there. It's pretty awesome. There's local uh, grief share is a nice local one. A lot of churches have their own need assistance like that. Call your local funeral home. We're happy to help direct people to those kinds of services, um, you know, because usually they're coming to us with their information. So we usually have some. Yeah, that's good to know. So I think the things I'm taking away from this, from our whole conversation is number one, above all, communicate your wishes to your family or even to the funeral home that you intend to be taken to. It's not necessary to pay anything in advance, which is also very helpful for several families, I'm sure, who, are, who might be listening. And just know that the funeral director and the mortician, they're there to support you in your time of need. So... I mean, if your gut feels, if you feel like something's wrong, then that's one thing. But for the most part, they are there to support you and they care about your experience uh, being able to say goodbye to this person that you cared about so much. Absolutely. And and I always tell families when they come in and they seem very, oh, I don't know what casket to choose, or I don't know what this, or I don't know if I want to see them or not. I usually say, what is your gut instinct? Don't even think about it. Tell me what your gut instinct is. And that's what they usually go with. And they're pleased. I really am honestly believe that your body is on autopilot and will take care of itself. You need to listen to it. If there's any time to listen to yourself, it's when you're on autopilot. That's That's good good advice. advice. If you love us, you have to subscribe. You have to uh, rate and you have to review and you have to write nice things about us. You have to touch all the stars. (laughs) Reach for the stars. Reach for the stars. All five of them. Yep. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for being here, Jennifer. One day ever let you down. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Well, make a choices. And uh, use your gift cards and communicate your wishes because that's what Jennifer says to do. Do it. Okay. Bye. 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 Hey 
friends. Thanks for listening to the CKNGK podcast. Find us at CKNGK podcast on Instagram and Twitter and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or anywhere else that you pod. See you next time.